Good evening once again, and welcome to What Saith the Scripture. I'm Brant Stubblefield. And I'm Christian Franklin. Christian, tell our audience tonight what we're going to do, and welcome them to the broadcast. You know, Brother Brant had an excellent idea, and also, by the way, it's good to have you back. I know you've been 
traveling and doing gospel meetings. And, yes, good to be and, back. And uh, obviously recovering from certain things. But yeah, uh, tonight's broadcast is going to be centered around, centered around the idea of the raw truth about. So what we had discussed is taking some points and some principles of Scripture that we have discussed before, but we wanted to do more of a, quote unquote, a rapid fire or more of a condensed uh, Q&A. So we wanted to bring up some certain points and get to the right. point, you know, and so I think people sometimes, they, they ask us the same questions over and over, even after watching our material, so we want to just get to the point tonight with some of these Yeah, and make it so distinctively plain that hopefully we can help someone that is struggling in an area or simply wants more information in regards to something that uh, they're dealing with. Right. Christian, we know in John chapter 8 and verse 32, Jesus said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free or set you free. The only way that we're going to be free completely free from all the things that, that cause us trouble religiously is going to be if God's truth releases us from the bondage. And, and Satan, of course, the father of all lies, John 8 and 44, mm -hmm. has many people in bondage because they are listening to voices that are not the truth. That's right. We're, we're here to preach the word, 2 Timothy yes. 4, 2. So uh, whatever, whatever we teach, we want to make sure that ourselves, like we examine ourselves, and we uh, teach those things which are sound doctrine, Titus chapter yes. 2 and verse number 1. And I love the passage you brought up here, Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, if you don't mind me reading that. Amen, let's read it. The Bible says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am approved. And the Lord answered at me and said, write the vision mm -hmm. and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. The great prophet Habakkuk was, is uh, speaking here on behalf of God, recording this, and I entitled it, Make It Plain. Mm -hmm. The raw truth has to be made plain to right. people. Now, we realize we don't live in the age of visions, and we're not claiming to have received a vision, but here's the point of it. The principle was, then when they received visions, now when we have the Word of God in its complete form, either way, the point is, it should be made plain to the people. Mm. The verse says, make it plain, write it upon the tables, and as the runner came by, headed to his destination, it should be so plainly written, that is, the legible characters displayed so well upon the table, written engraved, that when he runneth, that he could glance over and read it and keep on going to his destination. Amen. So tonight, Christian, on whatever we speak, we want to buy the truth and sell it not, Proverbs 23, 23, and make it so plain, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, that on your way to wherever you're going, that you can listen to this and know exactly what the Bible says on these timely topics. Amen. Christian, I think we ought to just jump right into something tonight. Let's do it. Yeah. All right, I'd like to jump in to a point or two in regards to the Holy Spirit. Okay. The Holy Spirit is the third member of the Godhead, but we receive, or I do at least, in the meetings that I preach, okay, um, on the, the Facebook platform, social media, emails, etc. I probably have more people ask me questions in regard to the work of the Holy Spirit than any other subject. Mm. Now, here it is. They have been reading John 14 and John 16, and they want to know how it is that they access the power from the Comforter for the provisions that are spoken of by the Gospel according to John in the 14th and 16th chapters. Mm. Would you read those passages for us? Absolutely. John chapter 14 and verse number 26, specifically John 14, 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. We flip over to John 16, 13, the Bible says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. All right, Christian. These passages, I maintain, are in reference to the apostolic band. Mm -hmm. In other words, the apostles would be guided into all truth, and all things that they had been eyewitnesses to in the life of Jesus would be miraculously brought back to their remembrance. Now, they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in Acts, the second chapter, beginning at verse number one. This is not, this is not something for all believers under right. the Christian canopy in the New Testament church for all time. This was a limited context 
to a limited group, the apostles, for a limited time during the apostolic age. That's right. Acts chapter 1, verse okay. number 4, to continue on this thought. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but, Jesus speaking, wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Amen. So this, I, I put in capitalized letters here, apostles. This is Notice apostles. Holy Spirit baptism was never a commandment, but a promise. Promise. They yeah. were to receive the promise and to wait. Now, I, I want to go further in this. So what difference does it make, someone says, as to whether or not someone believes this was written to us? I'll tell you why it does. Because as a preacher of the gospel, Christian and I have to study before we present lessons. Mm. Now, the apostles, the apostles, all things were brought to their remembrance. Right. They had miraculous memory. They would be able to pin the apostolic doctrine of the New Testament epistles, after receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they would be able to pin all the things that God wanted them to through the power of the Holy Spirit, miraculously and without error, going all the way back in the life of Christ, some many years after his death, they would still be able to pin those events as if they were standing right there without any mistake. That's right. Their memories would not fail them because the Holy Spirit gave them what to teach and what to say and what to write. Amen. Now, do you ever have a passage in mind? Well, you I was just read? thinking what you were speaking upon, uh, some citations here, Ephesians, right. the third chapter, Go ahead verse and read 5, that. and 2 Peter chapter 1. But you're right. I mean, we, uh, you and I, we are preachers of the gospel, but again, we are not divinely inspired. Like, we do not have remembrance in a, in a supernatural way. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So this is in correlation in the context with what we've been stating Amen. with the apostolic band. Yeah. In other words, yes, Jesus is about, we have to get the context, right? Back right. it up. John 14, one. remember what Jesus said? Mm -hmm. Let not your heart be troubled. be troubled. You believe in God. He's saying, yes. if you believe in my Father, remember, Jews did not question the belief of the Father. Right. You believe in my Father, believe also, also in me. me. Yeah. Okay, who is he speaking to? The apostles. Why is he speaking? Because their hearts are troubled. Why are their hearts troubled? Because his impending, soon around the corner death, is inevitable to bring about the salvation of the world. Right. However, the apostles, being humans, would no doubt be discouraged. Mm. He's trying to elevate them. Then in that chapter, and he expounds it all the way to chapter 16, this beautiful theme, that he's going to leave them, but he's going to give them the remembrance. Yes, the remembrance through the comforter. The comforter, yeah. Okay, now, the reason he gave them the miraculous of the comforter, the Holy Ghost baptism, as promised in Acts chapter 1, the reason is because they were going to be the royal ambassadors mm -hmm. and the the beginning of the teaching of the gospel account after the resurrected Jesus. They're going to be commissioned from heaven, approved from heaven, and go out and teach all things, and their remembrance would be miraculously preserved. So listen to this, Christian. And this, this really troubles me at times. When I hear people say things that really, when you take it out of context, it's putting it somewhere where really it's not what it was designed to teach. Right. And it somewhat devalues the original power that it truly was when it was received. Mm. Listen to this. We all know this by memory, but I want to read it. Here we are in 2 Peter. We are in chapter 1, and we are in verses 19 and following. The Bible says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Listen to this. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. The Bible says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We don't have men today, I affirm, we do not have men today that are moved by the Holy Ghost as Peter and Paul was. Right. The Holy Spirit revealed the will of God to the apostles and prophets, Ephesians 3, 5. Right. Not to common, ordinary preachers of today. There was a reason it was revealed to apostles and prophets, not to us. So when people take these verses and they take them out of the context, what they're doing is they're basically claiming modern-day miraculous activity and devaluing the true miracle of the preservation of the text and the inspiration of the text 
that was given originally to the apostles and prophets. Amen. Well, we have so many things to cover tonight, Christian. Did you have something else on your mind? You know, fresh on my mind, okay. I say let's go ahead and just tackle this because we're getting into this. So I have heard the statement made over and over and over and again, and you can affirm this as well, okay. that when we, when we have taught before, maybe on our Facebook broadcast, maybe on Instagram Live, we have, we have read and we have taught from the word about uh, women being in subjection or okay. being in submission to men within the worship assembly, also within the home, but specifically within the corporate assembly, as mentioned in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. Now, I have heard this over and over by people, people in college, I know Nemo, you can affirm this as well, that we have heard this argument that women being in, su in subjection, that, that command or that even that phraseology used is cultural. I'm glad you brought this up. Some people are using the word cultural too much and throwing it around as if it is somehow, you ever played Monopoly? Yeah. That get out of jail free card. It's almost as if they're using culture to be the get out of jail religious card to dismantle what the beloved apostle Paul taught. Well, the first thing we have to look at when we're, is it a cultural concept or is it merely, uh, or sorry, merely cultural or is it an actual command? we have to look at the root and the source of it. Was it only in one location for a specific time, or was it broader in scope? Right. Read the passage in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, 8 and following, please. Sure. Starting in verse number 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly ray, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Verse number 11 in 1 Timothy 2, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Verse 12, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Here's where it gets good. Verse number 13, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. Okay. Verse 14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Yes. In verse 15, notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in the faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Too much, too many things are changing. Mm -hmm. Now, change is good when it's change in the right pursuit. We are to change from evil to good. We are to be, uh, to be a people who are constantly being transformed, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, right. to that which is holy and acceptable unto the Lord. But when change is to, again, I like the word dismantle, there is a dismantling going on in our country and even sometimes in the church that wants to dismantle all of the, as they see it, as they see it, just the old-fashioned era of a day and time gone by. Mm. Now, if it's just that, if it's just something that occurred for a few decades in America and it was cultural, so be it. But if these things are tied to the principles and commandments of teachings of Scripture, then we cannot allow ourselves to overlook what Scripture teaches. Right. And there are many people, many people now, trying to incorporate women into leadership positions in religion, even in the church. Now, we have to take a look at this. And you're right, Christian. When the Apostle Paul makes the argument as to why a woman may not teach nor usurp authority over the male, the argument he brings forth is not tied to culture, they're tied to... The beginning. The beginning, mm -hmm. which is the order of creation. God established an order. What is that order? The order is Adam being first formed. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Paul would argue in 1 Corinthians 15, 45 that Adam was the first man. And 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he brought forth that the head of every woman is... Man. And the head of man is... Christ. At the head of Christ is? The Father. So we know God established the creation order. Now, if he established it and he said, Paul, and by the way, we got to go back to our earlier point. Paul was inspired of the Holy Spirit. So when he spoke or wrote, it is not him that is speaking, but the Spirit speaking through him. That's what Peter addresses. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Who are we to question the Holy Ghost? Right. The Holy Ghost preserves this teaching from the creation order. Adam first formed. Now, because Adam was first formed, God gave him certain leadership responsibilities and down through the ages of time. Right. And the second point was Eve fell into transgression because of deceit. That's right. 
And wouldn't it be similar, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but wouldn't it be similar to Matthew chapter 19 when Jesus is being tempted? He's being, yes, he is being uh, put on, put in the limelight to try to defend, right, yes. marriage uh, and God, the, the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. Good so point. he goes to Matthew 19, verses 1 through 9. For those of you, I know we're going through, but this, he goes back to the beginning. That's right. To, to affirm his teaching. You bring up just a masterful illustration there using the Bible. The best illustrations and contextual uh, pieces to help solidify the whole here is the Bible itself. We need less stories and more biblical teachings and, and illustrations. Right. So Jesus illustrates the same thing from Paul. They come to Jesus, the Pharisees, right? And they're trying to tempt him. Master, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? The answer, Jesus says, from the beginning, beginning. he goes back to the creation order, to the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those first five books he goes back to to solidify the fact that from the beginning made he them male and female. And there's no dispute there. Right. When Jesus or an apostle goes back to the creation order, the Holy Ghost solidifies the point and we are not to dismantle it. God is not demeaning women and those who charge that are either A, ignorant of the biblical text or B, they do not know God or C, both. Because our God has been good to both male and female. Amen. This is not about the salvation of our souls. In that sense, there's neither male nor female, Galatians 3. But this is about the creation order. And if congregations don't start teaching this, Christian, okay? And I mean proactively teaching it, then there's going to rise up a generation that is going to infiltrate the assemblies with women that are going to attempt to be in leadership positions. Amen. Hit around the head. You mind if we, uh, I've got another one sure, real fast yeah. and then we'll keep going here. But speaking about the topic of 1 Timothy chapter 2, I've even heard this, and I was talking with you about this today, that modesty, if you have your New Testaments, 1 Timothy chapter 2, specifically verse number 9, Paul writing, that modesty, right, women, it's interesting too how he makes a distinction between men and women here. Women, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Now, I have heard this, sadly, even from some of our own brethren. All right, what is it? That modesty or modest apparel is not defined within Scripture. Well, that won't work for this simple reason. Now, we're going to do what? Make it plain. What does it right. mean? That he that runneth by on the way to his destination can look over and glance down and see from the characters legibly written... What is the plain vision? Mm. And today, we don't receive vision. We receive the word of God. We receive the complete, complete will of God. So we make it plain in the preaching of the gospel through the bringing out of the text so that they may understand. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 8. Amen. Make it plain. We know that modesty has to be defined. Here's why. God does not give us a commandment of what to do and then not define it for us. Mm -hmm. could, you imagine, <laughs> could you imagine a debate between how to, to handle and to carry out a command, yet there's no definition to the command? I mean, mm -hmm. when it says, for example, love one another, do we know how to love? Well, sure, because the Bible defines it. Right. Then it gives us illustrations throughout, throughout the text on what it means to love. It would do us no good to preach, love one another, and then never to explain it. Right. It would leave people helpless and without any ability to move toward the love of God. And that's why Nehemiah says it's not just that they read in the law of God distinctly, it's that they gave the sense and caused them to understand. So we know from the entirety of the 66 inspired books, when we put it all together, that God has a teaching on modesty, and that teaching is from where, Christian? From the Word. From the Word of God, but I mean oh. basically from the knee up oh, to about the shoulder. The, yeah. Right? I was in a mid-thought right think there. Think about yes. it. <laughs> You know, you see some people with dresses all the way down and, you know, in the 20s that couldn't cover the, remember, all the way down to the ankles. Well, God wasn't that strict in the Scripture. If you think about modesty, it's not that he's, he's not overkill strict. Right. He is as strict as he desired to be strict. He's not any looser than he, than, uh, than he wanted to be. He's not any tighter than he wanted to be. Mm -hmm. He is exactly right according to his character. And in the Bible, and I wished 
give us a week or two and we'll go through this again because we can't do a rapid fire on modesty other than make it plain through this. Right. When you study it out in the Old and New Testament, you will see that that's always the case that it's to the shoulder, to the knee. Yeah. And all of the areas that would be what we would call sexually private areas, right, right. are covered so that the temptation of lust is not incited by the opposite. Right. And it's to reveal our inner character instead of trying to accentuate in a lustful way the outer man. That's right. You know, real quick, uh, oh, go to it. Go to Isaiah it. chapter 47, verses 2 through 3. Uh, this really opened my eyes when I studied this more in depth here. But even by Isaiah the prophet, it's recorded. Isaiah chapter 47, verses 2 through 3, just one yes. of many examples here. Yes. But the Bible says, Take the millstones and grind meal, uncover thy locks, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers, Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. So basically what I'm seeing here is through implication. Isn't it the case that bearing the leg, uncovering the thigh? It's nakedness. It's nakedness. That's yeah. why in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, remember the Pentateuch, the foundation, mm. the beginning points of things that God alludes back to. And if you'll read that, they knew, remember, they were naked. Right. And they sewed fig leaves, mm -hmm. remember? And that covering, if you study that out, yep. that covering covered them just like we're talking about in all the area they needed to be covered in. Yep. In the New Testament, do you remember when Peter was approached? I mean, mm. I'm sorry, not Peter. Hold on here. I got something in my mind running through rapid fire tonight. I can't get it all straight. You remember when yep. Jesus, preached, uh, Jesus approached the boat? Yeah. They were out fishing? All right. He went and put his tunic or his shirt on. Right. Why? Because Jesus is approaching him. That's a sign of modesty. On and on. I just want you to see tonight that yep. modesty is defined. So here's what's happening. We have people today that think that they can wear, you know, bikinis and short, what I call shorty shorts and, and all kinds of things. Not only do they wear them out in public. Yeah, I mean, I've never seen anyone wear a bikini to the house of the right. But I have seen people wear shorty shorts and things that are entirely not appropriate. But... All right, if you take the position that it's only cultural and you can't define it, how would you argue against that? Yeah. But the scripture says that our light ought to shine before men, Matthew chapter 5. Right. The scripture says that we ought not to run with them the same excess of right, 1 Peter chapter 4. The scripture says that we ought to be modest, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 9, and you're correct. These verses and a plethora of more teach us that the exposure of the thighs and all of the area between the shoulder and knee is an area that God did not intend to be exposed. That's right. I've even heard, when I was studying this with an individual, they said, well, you're going to Genesis 3. It's not taught. that The tunics that were made, they don't go shoulder to knee. So we'll, we'll explore that later on in a different we will. episode. But, but I'll say this. Fire, so. The more I have gotten into this study over the last 10, 15 years, every time someone tries to, to throw a rock at it, and I have to go back and study it more, save them without exception. You know what it's done for me? It's reaffirmed that what we're teaching is correct. Right. Because when you study it from just an honest viewpoint, and you look up the words, you look up the context, and you look up all the sister passages, it comes back every time the same point. Yeah. So, Christian, here's one we had come in. Okay. All right. Concerning humility, the Bible says, mm -hmm. obviously, humility is important. Right. God giveth grace to the humble, more grace to the humble, but he resisteth the proud, James chapter 4, four. Mm -hmm. number 6, I believe. Yes. But uh, the question is, this person is trying to relate this subject to their teenager. Mm. They would like for us to demonstrate someone in the New Testament, a character in the Scripture, that they feel as though, that we feel as though, excuse me, would be able from that character in their life to show a practical example of what humility looks like. Sure. Now, you may have your own. I thought of John the baptizer. Mm -hmm. And... Do you have that open and ready? Sure. I was going to go to uh, John chapter 3. Go. Uh, just an example here. But, yes. Uh, John chapter 3 here. Actually, excuse me, Matthew chapter 3. Okay. I was <laughs> rapid fire, you know what I'm saying. Uh, Matthew chapter 3. And we see the account. We see the baptism, right? The bat Jesus being baptized okay. for the sake of righteousness, Matthew 3, 15. Uh, boy, I'm, there we go. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, 
make his path straight. And we read within the context of this chapter, right? We skip down yes. in verse number six. We'll kind of do a condensed version here. And we're baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. This is the baptism of John, Mark chapter one, verse number four. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees, therefore every tree which bringeth forth, not forth good fruit is honed down, honed down, excuse me. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier yes. than I. This is what I want to get to. Mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That's powerful. Matthew 3, 11. That's powerful. Yep. Now, here is the forerunner of Jesus, a man according to John chapter 1 that was sent of God, a man that the Bible says that uh, was a mighty, mighty, none hath arisen greater. Mm -hmm. The Bible described this man as a, as a giant of the faith because he said when he was preaching, it was told of him, what do you expect of John the Baptist? Do you expect him to be a reed blowing in the wind here and too? No, he was solid mm -hmm. under the teaching of, of the law. Now, so here's the question. How can someone practically look to John as an example of humility for a teenager? Because... John was a leader, undoubtedly, appointed by God and moving a large group of people towards the transition period of the coming of the Christ. Mm. But he also knew and was willing to listen to what he had been told, evidently, because he knew that since the one that was coming mightier than he was, he had to, with humility, be willing to exit at the proper time. And John chapter 3, verse 30, nails us on the head, Remember what he said? He says, he must increase, but I must decrease. Amen. Mm. John said, Jesus must increase, but I must decrease. To me, that statement could never have been made from the lips of John if he had not had a heart of humility. What comes out of our mouth is tied to our heart, and so his heart had been conditioned with humility, and he doesn't remember, when we get into an area like this in our life, a crucial moment, mm -hmm. we can't immediately find humility that we don't already have. Right. In other words, we, we can't, in the crux of the matter, respond favorably with the right heart and character if we have not conditioned ourselves prior to. Right. So if we go back and we think about what you had stated, even earlier on, he said, whose shoes, whose latches I am not worthy to unloose. He already had that heart, Christian. Yeah. And so we need to teach our teenagers that to be followers of Jesus, we must have a heart like John of humility that's willing to do whatever it takes to advance the cause of Christ. Amen. Did you have a question about the Lord's Supper? Yes, we did. And, and this is something that probably a lot of people don't take the time maybe to realize, mm -hmm. but uh, make it clear. Turn over to Luke, the 22nd chapter, Christian, if you will. Do sure. some reading over there. Luke, the 22nd chapter. Now, this was the Passover. This was prior to, we'll put an arrow back here, mm -hmm. this is prior to the death of Jesus on the cross. When he eats the Passover meal with the apostles, he has not yet died. Now, when I say apostles, I want to clarify this. At this point, they are not officially recipients of the Holy Ghost baptism, but they have called to become apostles. They have been trained to be apostles. They're getting very close to the time in which they're officially going to, in every sense of the word, be absolutely qualified to take the gospel out. Right. All right, now, what does Jesus say about prepare the Passover? Do you have that handy? I'm in Luke chapter 22. Let's see. Try to find the exact verse. Yeah, here. I should have given that to you earlier. No, you're good. Let's look down at uh, about verse 13. 13. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. Now, that's a key. Mm -hmm. Some people believe that Jesus ate the Lord's Supper with them. No. no. The Bible says, make ready the Passover. Passover. Now, go on and keep reading. Verse 14, and when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. All right. And verse 15, and he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover 
with you before I suffer. So he's going to eat the Passover with them. All right, now keep reading. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So he's not going to eat with them anymore until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now right. we know under the New Testament, the kingdom of God, that we're not going to eat the physical Passover anymore because Christ is our Passover. First Corinthians chapter 5, 5 verse 7. 7. Amen. But we are going, we are going to take the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, but we can't take the Lord's Supper until the kingdom or the church is established and Jesus has died and he has ascended, Acts 1. He's been coronated. So in Acts 2, you have the king and the mm. kingdom. And then after the kingdom is established through the first people coming into its territory, then you have the eating of the Lord's Supper. But go back and read through Luke there uh, in verses, if you will, verses 16 through 20. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Now, the reason that we know that unleavened bread and unfermented uh, fruit of the vine, juice from the grape, mm -hmm. is to be utilized in the Lord's Supper is because he was using items from the Passover meal to teach the apostles what the Lord's Supper was going to become. Mm. He instituted it from the meal of the Passover. So you have to understand what the Passover was to understand that that's unleavened bread and unfermented, basically, fruit of the vine or fruit of the grape. Mm -hmm. So in Acts chapter 2, Christian, uh, when they obeyed the gospel, right. in verse 41, then what happened next? In verse 41, then they gladly received his word and were baptized. And the same day there added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse number 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Yes, um, I've heard people say a couple of things in the Lord's Supper. I want to make it quick tonight. Mm -hmm. They say that the Lord's Supper is never commanded. It's only by an example. And there's many things in the Scripture that we have example for that we don't do. They said like uh, baptizing and running water. Well, first of all, that's foolish because the running of water is coincidental, the mm -hmm. running water. It has nothing to do with the water's running or not. The definition of baptism says enough water to be buried in, Colossians 2 and 12. Now, when an example is binding is when there is a commandment. All right? Some say, well, there is no commandment to the Lord's Supper. All right? But there is. Paul said, take, eat. Take, eat. Right? He recorded that. Jesus spoke it. But I mean, take, eat. This do. All right? Now, if we have a commandment and we have a binding example in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, upon the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. Right. But that's not the first time they were breaking bread, Christian. No. That's just a narrative a historical account, an inspired historical account that tells us that Paul waited there to take it with the disciples because it was the first day of the week. But it was established in Acts 2.42 on the first Pentecost day, right? On right. that Sunday following the resurrection of Christ, that's the day when the Lord's Supper actually made its debut or beginning. Mm. And this is important because some people now are basically... Uh, teaching and subscribing to thoughts that, A, the Lord's Supper can be done on other days besides Sunday. That's incorrect. The only day we can take the Lord's Supper is the first day of the week, Acts 20 and verse 7. And secondly, some believe that it's just not that important anymore. And, and, and they, they fall off the wagon on that mentality. Some even argue. See, when he took this in Luke 22, that wasn't Sunday. Yeah, but wait a minute. That was not, the, he did not take the Lord's Supper. Jesus had not even died yet. No. This was simply from the Passover meal, he took elements to teach them about the institution of a meal that would first officially begin in the kingdom of God, which is the church, which had its beginning in Acts 2. Amen. Any other thoughts tonight, Christian? You know, I was thinking, uh, 
This is actually one that I just thought of real fast. Okay. And, you know, I, I've heard this being said, and hopefully we can answer it, or at least, least whet the appetite. But talking about the assembly, Hebrews chapter 10, verse right. 25, you know, not forsaking the assembly. I mean, they, they, I've had people ask me specifically, well, what, what does that entirely encompass, forsaking the assembly? We right. read it all the time in Hebrews 10, but what does it what does it mean? So, I don't know if we could... Sure, we'll make it plain. Make it plain, yeah. There is, and the text does not say merely assembly. It says, uh, if I got that right, I'll just say assembling. Right. If I spelt that correct. The assembling. Well, we know there is one time a week in which every local church of Christ is commanded by God, and we are privileged to come together not only to observe the Lord's Supper, but to enter into full worship with all five acts. Some congregations have two assemblies on Sunday, okay? Now, Hebrews 10 and 25 teaches me that we are not to forsake that. Some people want to try to make a play on words and say, well, the word forsake means to completely abandon. Mm. So they feel as though if they check in occasionally that they have done justice to Hebrews 10.25 and they have wiggle room. Well, that won't work for a lot of reasons. Number one, the whole point of this passage is Hebrews was written sometime between 64, 65, probably somewhere in there. The destruction of Jerusalem is coming in AD 70. Mm -hmm. Some of the early Christians were, were stopping the assembling. No doubt of fear of what was about to come because things were escalating. So the writer of Hebrews said, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves as the manner some already is. What should you be doing? Provoking one another to love and to good works. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 10 and 24. Well, how are we going to provoke one another to love and to good works if we don't see each other and we don't promote the good of the church in the local congregation? The corporate assembly, Christian, is highly important. And those who over a period of time abandon that and miss more and more they will feel more comfortable about missing the assembly the longer they stay out. Mm. Now, there are times, I want to make this clear, we have people watching. You know, we have uh, one lady that watches, I believe, way out in Arkansas, different places. You know, if a person is bed fast, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who have the ability to. Right. Okay, let's make that clear. Right. But there is the power and the importance of assembling. So here's my point. Can someone just do the minimum sliding on Sunday morning? And don't come to class. You just, just come in for the five acts and leave and say, I'm covered. No, this is more than just, this is more than just uh, checking some box here. This is putting my heart and soul in the local congregation, being active, being involved, right. being excited to go to the house of God to worship, that physical location. I realize the physical location. I'm using the house of God in the sense of the assembly, wherever that would be in these walls or out under an oak tree. But the point I'm making here is that it's our mindset towards it. And if we don't look to the assembly in a positive way and, and yearn for that, there's something already wrong with our Christian faith. It's slipping. Yeah. You know, I need to make it uh, kind of along that line of thinking. You know, I, I've heard people use, uh, actually somebody, I can't remember how far back, maybe a month or two ago, was trying to argue about vacationing. I said, what, what, are, you, what, are, you, what are you trying to get at here? Well, well uh, my family and I, we're, we're traveling on vacation, okay? So we're, we're just, we're not able to. We, we, we get it. We understand it's, it, it's commanded. It, it's stated in Scripture. But we are just not well, able to fit. I, I've heard that. I'm sure you've probably heard that too. All right, just, not to toot our own horn, but I'm going to tell right. you right now. My wife and I have been married since 2003. We've traveled, I would say, on quite a few vacations for, sure. for uh, our amount of time together. We have always assembled with the saints wherever we were. One time we found ourselves on a boat. I thought, well, what are we going to do here? We found other people on that ship and had an assembly right there on that boat, a two-hour assembly. I mean, we had the whole deal right there on that boat. So what I'm saying is, is this. You do what you want to do, right? And wherever your heart is is where your actions will follow. There is nothing I enjoy more on traveling than to finding new saints in places. Yep. And Christian, like a lot of places, especially after COVID, sometimes numbers are down, morale is down, 
And when a young family walks in, you know, my wife and I have four children. When, when four of us, uh, children and two, that's six total, when we all walk into a place, only 40, mm. 50, 60 people, sometimes that puts smiles on their faces even before anything else. So we need to commit to being faithful to the assembly even when we're vacationing, even uh, when we're out of the ordinary geographical area in which we live, we should join ourselves to those local disciples if at all possible. Mm. You know, it really is a reflection on our dedication in our hearts. I yes. mean, in the hearts up here, we've talked about this before. We make excellent points. And forsake, I mean, but what's sad, the reason I brought that up, okay. not to be poking or prodding individuals, I'm not saying, oh, you can't vacation. The problem is, though, I, I see this more and more as, oh, well, our itinerary or our schedule doesn't allow for, or we have reservations. I, I, I've heard it all. I'm sure you have, too. Yeah, we have, I mean, too, it's, just, it's just ridiculous. Like, and, but here's and the it, thing. Sometimes we've had what I call extended family with mm -hmm. us, right? Right. Let's say you go to Branson for, for uh, Thanksgiving, let's say. Mm -hmm. Well, most of our family is our dedicated members, but you always have a few that may not be there yet, right? Right. They may not either, A, be in the Church of Christ, or B, they may be lukewarm. Mm -hmm. So you have a decision to make. So let's say that, that Thanksgiving falls on a Sunday. Well, they know they're not going to, I mean, they know we had set that groundwork years ago that we're going to go to the downtown congregation in Branson. That is a faithful congregation of God's people. And that's where we're going to be on the Lord's Day. And again, that evening, we're going to go back to that congregation. Y'all would say, well, how do you know they have services there? Because I've been to the Branson Church of Christ. I know how they are. They have services. Amen. So we're going back there on Sunday evening. Now, if one of those people want to stay at the house, we're not going to force them, right? right, right. That, that's their choice. But I'm also not going to cave in and stay with them and forsake the assembly of the local congregation. Right. So to me, that's something, Christian, and I know that you know, you're contemplating marriage, okay? That's something that you have to set in order prior to the establishment of your home. Right. And I would urge all young people, you know, those are the kind of things you need to be talking about before you get married. If you're already married, sit down and discuss those things and let your in-laws or, or let people know, say, hey, we're not going to badger you. We'll always invite you to come. But if you don't come with us when we're on vacation, we will see you at one o'clock after services are out. Sure. You know, it, it, that's a good point. You know, how it uh, starts within the home and it starts early. Uh, one of the lessons you gave a class that you taught here uh, months ago, you know, 2 Kings chapter 20 and verse number 15. I know this may not be a question, sure. but I, I think it's important establishing these things early on. It, some of the, the class that I taught back in a congregation out in Arkansas, they, they, they loved this perception because they, they asked about this. They yes. talked about the assembling. It has yes. to be established within the house. What have they seen in thine house? 2 yes. Kings 20, 15. That's Isaiah to Hezekiah. But the point is like, what, what are people going to see? How, how's that going to reflect upon you if your family yes. is forsaking the assembly? I mean, that's... I, I'm glad you brought this up. And let's go you know. a little bit further here. I know it's rapid fire, but let, cause this, yeah. this is a different element within the same concept. Mm. I'll tell you what part of the problem is. Sometimes we are so quick to remove ourselves from the words law and duty, mm. we do ourselves an injustice. For example, I understand, and I look forward to, and it's a great privilege and opportunity to come to worship God. I understand that. But it is also a royal duty for all priests in the churches of Christ to locally, right, right. faithfully attend that congregation. Now, we're all priests. I'm not talking about in a religious garb sense. Right. Right. I'm talking about the 1 Peter 2.9 concept that ye, we are a royal priesthood. All members, all members, Nemo says we have a half hour left, let's go. All members are to participate and to function in worship, all right? So we have a royal duty, and we have an opportunity, and we have a privilege. Sometimes we only emphasize privilege so much and opportunity, some people walk away thinking, well, yes, but I can also catch it next week. It doesn't take as much for me, or I'm a pretty good person anyways. Well, there's so much wrong with those statements, it's right. embarrassing. But the truth of the matter is, Christian, we have... We have both an opportunity and a duty to the local congregation, and we need to take that duty seriously. Amen. Amen. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Someone said, well, that's not a commandment. Yes, it is. It's a direct negative commandment, just like thou shalt not kill. Do not, not forsaking, the King James says, the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, as much more as you see the day approaching, that's A.D. 70, 
as the manner of some already is. Now, by the way, we know the local church convened every first day of the week in one location. The Bible says in multiple times in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and in chapter 14 that when the whole church comes together, the whole corporate body from babies to the eldest among us, there is at least one time a week when the whole local body is to convene in a formal assembly and carry out the acts of worship. Amen. By the way, Christian, there is a question here, correct? What have they seen? In thine house. Mm -hmm. What have our neighbors seen in our house? Do our neighbors note our faithfulness to the assembly, rain, snow, sleet, or shine, that we back out our automobile and that we head to services? What have they seen in our house? What have our children seen in our houses? Have they seen mother and father dedicated to the attendance of the church? What have they seen in our house? Have they seen those in the athletic realm, in the school realm, of our peers, have they seen us be faithful? Right. This is not by itself going to get us to heaven, but I'm going to tell you right here and right now, you cannot go to heaven unless you are faithful in the attendance of the local church. Amen. Amen. That'll preach, Christian. That <laughs> will, yeah. Someone said, make it plain. I hope we made it plain. Made it plain, yeah. Right. Now, again, we're not talking about the one that's bed fast, the one that's in a nursing home. We're talking about those that can make it, mm -hmm. right? Christian, do you have any other thoughts for tonight? You know, uh... I'm trying to think, uh, sometimes you hear thoughts or you hear statements being made, and even from content that we have shared, um, and by the way, we do want to say a quick thank you to some of our viewers. Oh, I've yes. actually, we, we've received some, uh, this is not rapid fire, but we've actually received a couple messages that our content is being shared at smaller congregations that may not have a located preacher or someone to help lead uh, classes or to teach sermons, so we, we want to let you all know that these lessons are for your use. We want you guys to not only view these lessons, but if you want to share them with your friends, share them with your congregation, we encourage you to do so. Uh, and it's a privilege to be able to do that as well. So, From the small town of Velma, Oklahoma, three weeks ago, I received this question. Can Jesus actually forgive deep, ugly sins? Now, when I communicated with the person, they were in reference to sexual sin. They did not give me the specifics of, of the one, but evidently it, it is something that has been on their mind. Now, let me start by saying this. Yes, those sins are deep and ugly, and that's why a person is burdened by them. Mm -hmm. When a person asks the question, can Jesus actually forgive my deviant, deep, and ugly sexual sin, it tells me that that sin has bothered them much more than they realize, Christian. Mm -hmm. Sin is a burden, right? Right. And we don't fulfill the order of God's natural law, Romans chapter 1. It comes back to haunt us. So sin is ugly. Make that very clear. But it hurts me to think that there's people right here in the state of Oklahoma in the Bible Belt that truly wonder whether or not they can be forgiven. If there's ever a sermon... If there's ever a topic, we want everybody to know that yes, not only can Jesus, the word can implies ability, and mm -hmm. folks, he has the mm -hmm. ability. He does. So not only can Jesus forgive your deep and ugly sins, he desires to forgive them. Christian, how can we make that plain tonight? Well, I immediately think of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Okay. One of the, one of the uh, verse references here, and this is in, in reference to unrighteousness and, and who will not okay. inherit the kingdom here. But 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators. So we're going to focus on okay. fornicators here. And it gives an exhaustive list, but I want to skip down to verse 11 here. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 11, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So, obviously, the question to me can be answered specifically Amen. within that, many other passages as well. Amen. But that one sticks out to me because you have been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers. I mean, you. And let, let's I mean, even go. Is, I mean, yeah. they didn't ask me this, but it makes me wonder. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, what my wife went. Are they referring to molestation, mm -hmm. lewdness? I don't know. But. And I know some people disagree with us on this, but I don't care if, if, hey, 
We're going to make it plain and teach the Bible regardless of what people say. Amen. That's our job. I don't care who it is. But look, one of the greatest explanations and proofs of God's grace is that he receiveth sinful men. Not that he condones the activity of sinful men, but that he receiveth sinful men. Amen. I love the song, Christ receiveth sinful men. Does he have the ability to save deep, dark, ugly, past sins? Yes. Yes, he does. If Jesus cannot forgive your deep and dark, ugly sins, Christian, he cannot forgive us of our sins. That's right. But he died for all men, Hebrews 2 and 9. He, not only can he forgive us, he wants to forgive us. And Christian used a beautiful passage from the Corinthian epistle written by the beloved apostle Paul that instructs us that such were some of you, whether it's drunkenness, whether it's adultery, whether it's homosexuality, no matter what the sin is, that can be in the rear view mirror, cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and now you can be a sanctified saint in the house of God. Why? Because Jesus forgives. Amen. That's beautiful, Christian. Amen. That's the gospel. We need to let people know that Jesus is willing to forgive. No matter what the burden you have in your heart, you can find and receive absolute atonement through the blood of Christ. God is no respecter of persons, Acts 10, 34. Yeah. Yes, but after we make this clear, because of Jesus, you can live spiritually and be free from your sin. But if you read that passage again, the Bible says they had been washed. Mm. In other words, to receive forgiveness... Yes, Christ receiveth sinful men, but he receives them based upon the blood that he shed. So we have to find out in the scripture how it is that we can be washed so that deep, ugly sins can be removed and that we can now be sanctified and in the church of Christ. Amen. You know, washed, that, that makes you think of something. It makes you think of uh, water, doesn't it? Every time I think of the word wash, I think of you know, you being cleansed, but, you know, we think about clothes being washed in a washer. Well, there had to be water. Water is symbolic with the blood. Yes. Revelation chapter 1, yes. verse 5. So that, that leads beautifully into Romans, the 6th chapter. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. Now, this is Paul recounting to the church at Rome here. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Amen. So that also means if we are to walk in the newness of life, we are raised up like Christ, we become sinless. But how do we get to that? Is by being sanctified or being washed right. in the blood of Christ through baptism. That's right. Our completion, our saintliness, that righteousness is from the initial contact of the blood of Jesus that sets us into the church in what manner? In a sanctified manner. Sanctified. You don't enter the church as a sinner. You enter the church as sanctified. Now, the cross takes sinners and makes them sanctified. People have trouble with this in their minds, but the cross takes ugly sins and puts them out of the remembrance of God. That does not mean that he does not know what you did. It means he chooses not to hold it against you because now you are sanctified because the stripes that Jesus received were in your stead and on your behalf, and therefore he took the punishment that you deserve. Therefore, your deep and ugly sins have now been forgiven because of his atoning sacrifice and you were once these ugly, deep, dark things identified and defined you, but now you're defined by a sanctified life that Paul says is a new life for new creatures. And Christian, it's beautiful. Can Jesus actually forgive deep, ugly sins? Yes, but he only forgives sinners who believe wholeheartedly in his saving power and in his deity and in his name and in his sonship and in his kingship. Do you believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, repent of sin, turn from them, turn from this. Don't be identified by this anymore. Don't hold on to this. Turn from this and turn to Christ. Confess his name before men, Acts 8 and 37. And Christian, 
when someone is baptized into Christ and they contact the blood of Jesus, what happens? They put on Christ and also their sins are forgiven. Amen. They put on Jesus Christ and their sins are forgiven. Never to be held against them any longer. No. What a God we serve. Therefore, can Jesus actually forgive deep and ugly sins? Absolutely, yes. The proof is in the text, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. And it is a wonderful reflection upon the character of God and who we serve, that our God is good and benevolent to all of us. He's not willing that any should perish, 2 Peter mm, chapter 3, verse 9, right. but all should come to repentance. Amen. He has held back the second coming in delay, not because he's slack, but to give us time to preach and to teach, to tell all that we love and to care for, and all of, even our enemies alike, that there is a God in heaven who sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, into this sin-filled world, that all who would believe and obey could have these deep, ugly sins forgiven, and they could be set into the church as a sanctified person. Amen. Christian, are there any other comments or thoughts you have before we close out tonight? You know, I think there's been awesome content this evening, and you know, some of this is reiteration. We've taught on this sure. before, but haven't you said before, repetition is, is the mother key. of all learning. That's right. And the reason that people ask so many of these questions is because these are the things that we're dealing with in our generation mm. over and over and over. Right. It's important. There is a question that we hope that you and your household will be asking this week and asking to those friends and neighbors around you. It's a question found in the fourth chapter of Romans, verse 3. What saith the scripture? Long I have been waiting and so fondly contemplating, fondly my sweet home.